Uh, this is our second in a series in our series this this semester of visitors, visiting artists. Uh, Rick Brellinger a couple of weeks ago, and Aaron Knipe today. Um, I'm not going to do a long meandering introduction, but uh, Aaron is a graduate of, of the MFA here at Duke and also a graduate of the Corcoran School of Art, where he studied photography and among other things. Um, originally from Hickory, North Carolina, Aaron has been working for a number of years at, at the Rinalda uh, Museum of American Art. I think that's its actual name. Is that Rinalda House Museum of American Art in, in Winston-Salem is in communications and graphic design. Uh, your password to get in here was Plateau, which was the title of his MFA thesis, uh, looking at the at the Carolina Piedmont. And uh, I'll just say that, well, he also was the fellow, he was the Gedney, William Gedney Fellow at the uh, Archive of Documentary Arts at, at the Rubenstein Libraries here. A lot of interest in, in the history of, of photography, a, a lot of knowledge on the history of photography. Um, I've always admired the way that, that Aaron finds um, uh, kind of remarkable imagery in the most um, seemingly, or at least initially, unremarkable spaces. Uh, and then, of course, they become remarkable. So Aaron, it's great to have you here. I'm going to get, get out of the way and hand it over to you. We will take questions through chat, or this is very informal, so you can wait. and. Uh, ask them in, in the live virtual space or you can put them in chat and they'll sit there until Aaron uh, takes them up whenever. All right, thanks Aaron and uh, appreciate you being here. Thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, it's, it's great to be here. This is almost the perfect um, like presentation mode for introverts in some way. Um, when I was asking asking my friend who was giving a similar um, artist talk at the um, Camera Club of New York. She, well, she asked me planning for her talk, what, what's your lecture style like? What's, what, what do you do when you give a talk? Um, is it more kind of lecture or more like informal, informal conversation? Um, I would say yes, it's um, probably 60% uh, informal and 40% sort of looking at my notes and describing <clears throat> excuse me, describing what we're seeing. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's great to be here. And it was, it was great to put together this presentation um, for y'all. Um, so I'm going to kick it off and, and share my screen. So this is a um, just a very short survey of um, of my work. They're not really necessarily the greatest pictures or even great pictures, um, but they're they're turning points in my career so far. Um, from these projects, I'm about to show you work sort of grew out grew out of uh, from me and led to what what would I what would I create next? Um, so yeah, it, it was a there's almost been like three different versions of myself. There was one, the student studying photography here and at Corcoran, at Duke and at Corcoran. Um, and there's also the, the parent artist. Um, our daughter just turned uh, one year old back in December. Um, so there's been a few different versions um, of myself and, and this work, but the kind of, the kind of continuing thread has always been home um, and photography, the, the medium itself. Um, I sort of marked those changes or views of um, views of the medium and views of just what I do. Um, so, so, so these pictures sort of chronicle that time. Some, some feel in retrospect, some feel naive, some feel young didactic. Um, but what I really want to show was, was just what I think of as a growth. Um, so um, yeah, the, they're, they, they take you back from 20, um, 2011 to up until 
um, a few weeks ago um, where I started a new product about photographing um, my family. And if, if I'm a little, <laughs> if I'm a little like kind of out of sorts, it's my, my brain doesn't <laughs> work since being a parent, my brain doesn't, <laughs> it's hard to get back to talking about art when you haven't talked about it for a long time. Um, my brain is just being replaced with sort of more of the moment knowledge, like um, putting together high chairs and um, installing car seats and whatnot. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty rusty and I'll just go ahead and say that. Um, so this is a holistic snapshot of my short life in photography so far. So from wherever you're joining me tonight, um, thank you. I hope that you're in some place because that's better than any place. My some place um, right now is in Winston-Salem, um, but I found my photographic voice in Hickory, North Carolina, uh, as Tom said. Um, I spent a lot of time outside um, during the one, one of the many creeks that trickle through uh, Catawba County. Um, I learned mostly through the internet um, and at our high school's uh, photography class, the technical in and outs of, of the camera. Um, like how to make car headlights seem like light trails on the highway or water seem like gauzy sheets on rocks. Um, my work since usually features small, small creeks and rivers um, in an effort to kind of get back home. So this is, this felt like sort of a starting place for me. In 2008, I happily escaped um, Hickory, North Carolina to Corcoran School of Art in Washington, um, DC. The school was inside um, the city's oldest private museum of the same name, um, home to some real treasures of American painting and photography um, and some really great gallery openings. Um, you could get some wine and cheese while you were, while your prints were washing in the dark room. Um, even though it was only in Washington, not, a, not the biggest um, city, but it was a, still a huge leap for me um, being from rural North Carolina. Um, it was totally transformative and eye-opening. And I, this is where I learned to be an artist. Um, and this is where um, I saw William Eggleston's work for the first time and started saying, hey, if this, this kind of looks like home to me and if, and if pictures of one's home can be a part of um, a major museum retrospective, the one for, that the Whitney did, then you know maybe I could have a voice in that too. Um, but perhaps no no bigger um, no bigger eye or a way to shape my point of view. There's no bigger influence than than my instructors there. Um, some, some fairly large names in, in photography, but also ones that, that sort of flew under the radar, um, you know, in the, in the photographic world. Um, one, if, if you took a look at my alumni six pack blog post that, um, that Ted has been spearheading, um, I wrote a little bit about Frank DiPerna. Um, who started the photography program at Corcoran in the 70s and was just the most gentlest, kindest, wisest photographer, teacher I've, I've ever known. Um, he died late last year, but um, his sort of approach to the landscape, the, the sort of sensitive but aloof um, way of seeing the world and a little bit ironic um, view of the world um, really influenced me and in how I take pictures and, and especially see color. Um, and Terry Weifenbach too um, taught me how to really see color um, in this way with a, a really sensitive approach to, to, to beauty and, and the mundane. Um, as Tom mentioned before, not remarkable on, on, on an initial glance, but but through photography and through simple seeing um, and printing and scale, you know things like that, you could you can make the most normal places look look remarkable, and that's that's what Terry has been doing, um, you know, for decades. And 
this is where I sort of learned my love of books, um, photo books from Terry. Um, again, it's one of those analog things that are that are lost almost to the past, but it, it takes five minutes to get um, color prints out of the color, um, um, the color paper processor. So during that time, um, you know, she had all these books sitting on top of the on top of the on top of the dryer, and we sort of flip through those while we we're waiting for our prints and um, sit on couches. It was just a real small, um, intimate atmosphere that that Terry created um, for us, and um, it has a way of sticking with you. And and a really great um, instructor I had was Margaret, um, who was um, ironically from Statesville, North Carolina, um, who spent a, a good amount of her career photographing her family uh, in Iredale County. And that was sort of a happy, um, happy coincidence um, to work with Margaret, who's an expert black and white printer um, who now teaches at um, Radford University. So it's, it's not really, you know, looking back at this project like 10 years later, um, I don't think there's anything quite remarkable about it, but what's, but what's still remarkable to me is um, the way in which, um, the way in which I took one project idea and um, it sort of felt like mine. It wasn't, it wasn't an instructor giving me an assignment. It wasn't just a technical exercise. It was actually, this sort of felt like what I would, I was personally invested in this project in a way. Um, so this is about my, my grandfather, Sam Knipe, who died in 2011. Um, so when I was looking through his, his personal effects, um, I found his senior high school yearbook um, called the acorn um, and you know seniors have their senior quotes near near their photograph and, and his was um, I Sam Knipe will my aggravating ways to anyone who wants them with the hope that they don't get into as much trouble as I have so I visited his house um, a week or so after he passed away. Um, so in this in this small series, um, I think I really started began to use photography as um, as what Robert Adams says. Robert Adams said, "Photography and poetry." center on metaphor, um, finding things done and left undone. Um, in the same way Adams uses um, light and shadow to describe um, you know, his, his place in, in Colorado or in the American West, um, I sort of thought about those things, light and dark as, um, you know, as metaphors in themselves um, to say what I wanted to say. And this was one taken at an eighth of a second and it's it's sharp for all the photography people out there, handheld at an eighth of a second. Um, for anything, that's, that's why I like that picture. So visiting his his home and um, the, the the city where he grew up, um, you know, finding things done and left undone um, became a big part of that um, the editing process.
And then the, the metaphor of like a um, baggage seeming like a casket um, with my origi origination point um, at the airport. See, look, looking back at this project again, um, this, is, but this has been a part of my sort of lecture, um, at least to show sort of my trajectory. Um, you know, I, like I said, I think there's some heavy handed pictures in here, maybe too didactic, saying too much, but I think the, I think the point of it stands. Um, you know, this is the point where I'd felt comfortable um sort of mastering at least black and white photography and processing um and printing and scanning um so this feels like a culmination of all what i had learned um from my instructors and then just from um editing down pictures to make a really tight um a really tight body of work in a short amount of time So my um, so I ended up this sort of mode of photographing in North Carolina while going while going to school in Washington. I sort of felt like this was I could operate this way, you know, go home on breaks, shoot just a ton of, of film and rolls, and um, and I felt good about it. And taking taking those photos back um, back to Washington gave me that gave me that sort of distance to be able to edit and to kind of see differently and to prioritize what I wanted to photograph um, on my next trip. Um, you know, I had to prioritize what I needed to go and, and where. Um, so this is my attempt in, in my senior thesis project in, grad, in undergrad to, um, to attempt to sort of loosely photograph my family, um, our family stories sort of told in passing um, from our point of origin, um, my great grandmother's family is from Iowa, South Carolina, originally. So I started there. Um, the title "Native Place" um, came, came from Iowa, South Carolina. It, it came from an um, it came from a, a cemetery. Um, in Iva, of a 12 year old boy whose headstone had sort of had a handwritten inscription um, that said, His soul in heaven has sought its native place. And this is how this project sort of began um, sort of dreamy, um, really uh, exploiting the, the tilt shift functions of a view camera. Um, and so I came back after summer of. 2011 with the sort of idea of a thesis in hand sort of dreamy pictures of of the landscape and of people um, and that even sort of changed over time too um, so the project is a mix of um, handwritten stories unphotographable moments um, highly influenced by the kind of moral lessons or kind of Sunday school lessons that Flannery O'Connor is, is sort of known for. Um, I put her quote at the beginning. Um, so this making large startling figures out of, um, out of the real world around her to, to say something um, in her sort of stern, in her sort of stern Catholic way. Um, so the, the, they were meant to be, uh, it's, it's my own handwriting, my own experiences, um, you know, sort of, like I said, unphotographable moments that you couldn't put into, put into images. 
because the ones that I would make in my head were a little bit better than what I could what I could photograph. So after, after some, um, <laughs> I, 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 I didn't really have that grasp of the tilt shift uh, form um, as a way of being like a dream. It was again, kind of maybe heavy handed or, or um, you know, just naive in that way. So I sort of corrected and adjusted um, after some feedback and they became more straight, um, more straight photographs. This is my dad. So it's um, longer stories like we saw in the beginning, standalone photographs and handwritten, um, handwritten text with photographs. Um, this is also in Iva, South Carolina. So with that, um, with that idea of mixing um, images and text and text and image, it was kind of my attempt at putting a photo book on the wall. Um, I wanted to give you that intimacy that you get when you hold a book in your lap um, and sort of punctuated by the color palette, which was mostly blue, mostly pastels, um, lots of hands um, sort of punctuated the project too. And these aren't these aren't all in South Carolina, but rather a mix of um, a mix of Catawba County and um, and South Carolina. my grandmother. This image wasn't initially part of the longer part of what I ended up putting on the wall for this project. Um, it's because it just felt so much different than the other ones, you know, it has that sort of glitch. Um, you want to call it glitch aesthetic, but it does it does sort of speak to that um, you know southern archetype of Andy Griffith and um, Opie, um, which was a way of of talking about you know father and son relationships. This is just a photograph of the television. I still got to keep some of my tilt shift uh, tendencies in there, but, but trying to make it make sense and, and lead your eye um, someplace rather than just kind of around. I actually have this, this Buckeye right on my desk right now, um, the same one. I've got it as a wedding present. I think the um, I think the lore is that it's for fertility.
Um, so it was around this time, 2009, 2010, um, that indie publishing and photography was really spiking, um, sort of with a, with a newfound interest in on-demand publishing, sharing, and cheap ways of circumventing um, galleries and museums. Books, books were that vehicle for me to express more of what I was interested in. Um, image, text, design, and material, because who doesn't love the smell of paper? I wish I could get that excited about muck. Nothing? Are you kidding? Page 73, Johnson, Maven, R. I'm somebody now. Millions of people look at this book every day. This is the kind of spontaneous publicity, your name in print, that makes people. I'm in print. Things are going to start happening to me now. I sort of felt that way. It's it's always it's never not cool to see your name in print and your name um, name on something tangible. Um, so this this sort of assignment um, sort of was the first assignment where I made where I made a photo book um, like by hand. Um, I was looking into um, I was looking into my family archival snapshots as well as. Um, one of my friends, a first generation Chinese American, and then finding um, finding similarities and differences just with our our home life is more of like a um, editing exercise than actual photography, and also just figuring out how to make a book uh, with what I had. Um, here's another project that came out of a of another assignment. Um, again, just trying to figure out how to make how to make books on my own um, with my own pictures. Um, so again, this is sort of looking at childhood drawings compared to contemporary photographs that I was making in and around Washington. Um, so it sort of has that frustration of. Um, of learning how to write and learning basically how to how to photograph again and learning how to make learning how to make things. Um, so they're they're kind of <laughs> they're kind of juvenile to begin with, just my craftsmanship. So I tried to exploit that with um, with crayons and um, sort of loose photographs that could you know be part of a whole composition um, that would speak well to one another. And this is from a. Um, one of the prayers we grew up um, learning. Another project I liked was um, this one looking at uh, the North Carolina um, Flickr Commons on, on Flickr. Um, you know, when that was a big thing, I guess it still is, but um, looking at images of um, women in bathing suits and um, Piggly Wiggly store openings, um, which are some really great really haunting interiors. Um, these are all digitized and made for public domain usage, but um, I sort of compiled these together, you know, based on um, um, John Updike's uh, short story, a and where um, the cashier, the main protagonist, um, sees some women in bathing suits get, um, um, they're asked to leave the store basically because of how they're dressed. So the um, the manager, the manager in the A and P, um, John Updike writes to those women in bathing suits. He says, "Girls, I don't want to argue with you. After this, come in here with your shoulders covered. It's our policy." He turns his back. That's policy for you. Policy is what the kingpins want. What the others want is juvenile delinquency. 
And so it was kind of through photo books in a way that I, I found my own um, way to be juvenile and a delinquent. Um, connecting with my friends, Nate and Jordan um, in college, we continued to ignite this um, ignite this love of, of indie books and photography zines and design. Um, so the three of us formed a, a collective called Empty Stretch to publish our friends' art and photography, as well as the stuff we love through um, online outlets like Flickr. Um, and it was in 2011 um, that the indie, indie Photo Book Library really took off, um, spearheaded by Larissa LeClaire. Um, she was based out of Arlington, Virginia at the time, and she was doing tours of her amazing collection of, of indie photo books. Um, and it's just a staggering amount, even at this time. Um, artists were just mailing her books for, for free and she was putting them on, on her website. And it was for someone who was interested in photography and books and design and just sort of wanting to learn more, she put all this information on there you know, readily available um, just out of her own time and resources. Um, so this is when they, when she had a pop up, um, a pop up in Georgetown um, during um, Photo Week DC. Just some really great titles um, in here. Um, so it was then Nate and Jordan and I um, sort of began assembling our own books together of, of our work. Um, you know, oddly enough, um, our first book was called Home, um, where we were photographing what that meant to us. Um, Jordan was on tour with, um, with his band at the time or with his friend's band at the time. And um, my parents had just moved to a new home. Um, and my friend Nate was back in Minnesota. So we had these varying landscapes, but all kind of with this approach of, um, you know, a little bit nostalgic over the holidays and a little bit, um, you know, a little bit looking back um, at, what, at what home means. Um, we also did a great Kickstarter project in 2012 that was um, was obviously um, exceeded <laughs> exceeded that goal of $2,200, um, where we asked lots of folks um, to photograph on the first day, uh, January 1st, 2012. Um, I think I think we sort of stole that from from an Nazreli um, Nazreli books idea of one picture book um, where it's a whole series of um, artists photographing over one day or one place in time. Um, so we had we had friends and colleagues pretty much spread out over um, over the globe during this time and it was all sort of how we pictured 2012. I, I don't know why 2012 was significant. I think it was um, Maybe because this is when the world was supposed to end, or something. One of the one of the ten times it was supposed to end. Um, so we're all kind of looking back and um, really promoting this product um, to be a bit more nicer product than what we had done um, before, and it it came out really nice. Um, and so so with that idea of. Um, of just curating and collaborating with folks online and then within our circle. Um, we started a series of, um, of books and zines called um, Petty Thieves. Um, it, would, it would be in many iterations. It would be you know, pocket sized zines. It would be newspapers. Um, it would be sort of nicer books like the one, um, like the one we saw previously. Um, it was kind of whatever we whatever the project was calling to do. Um, we kind of made it that um, that mainly centered around um, youth culture and um, online sharing. So this was our sort of um, there was a call for students to exhibit in Corcoran's Gallery Thirty One, um, although I think it's called something else now. Um, 
And they really hated us for painting <laughs> deep black on the white wall. This is our first iteration of, of Petty Thieves. It was a fold out newspaper, our sort of book, if you will. Um, printed so many copies of this um, that they ended up being kind of wallpaper for <laughs> future exhibitions. Um, so these were all of our all of our tiles at this point um, in 2013. Um, I think we're finally out of these newspapers, but um, it became a, we found other uses for it. Um, we mailed them out with other titles as a freebie um, since printing newsprint requires a, a bigger run. And the, the, the thing about, you know, our, our whole idea was to like give away um, what we were making. We didn't really want to keep anything because we wanted to be out in the world. We wanted to promote it um, and just send it and move on to the next thing. So none of us really kept <laughs> kept any of these titles. There's so many little little books and zines, um, except the rest of Leclerc has them now. Um, well, the Indy, well, the Beinecke at Yale has them now. Um, so if you're ever up there, you can see all the empty stretches um, publications. So to get, so to sort of cut back to doing photography, um, doing straight photography, one of the big, one of the big draws for coming to, to Duke University and working on my photography was, was that I could be close to home um, thinking about editing my work within the same space I was photographing. Um, I could work with advisors, mentors, and, and teachers. I could influence my art, and I could immediately act on those impulses and, and get feedback um, and just have more time to linger uh, in places, not sort of confined to a, a short trip, um, a short trip home. So throughout, throughout his career, um, novelist Thomas Wolfe made the North Carolina Piedmont and Foothills um, region a, a fulcrum for his characters' lives. Wolfe writes in his novella, The Lost Boy, speaking about the fictional town of uh, Altamont, um, set in North Carolina. He writes, it seemed to Grover that the square itself, the, the accidental masonry of many years the chance agglomeration of time and disrupted strivings was the center of the universe. It was for him in his soul's picture, the earth's pivot, the granite core of changelessness, the eternal place where all things came and passed and yet abode forever and would never change. So I began to pay even closer attention to, to my neck of the woods um, in Piedmont, in the Piedmont in North Carolina. Um, the term plateau is at once a nod to the topographical term, um, a portion of relatively high and flat ground between hills. Um, it's also an adjective describing a period of neither progression nor decline. Um, and it happened to be the same name of the road um, where I went to high school in Catawba County. Um, so if you're from Catawba County, it's, it's Plateau, not Plateau. The portraits, landscapes, and still lives um, made for this product are, are kind of in a ceaseless transition, um, worn by industry, time, erosion, the weather, particularly seen um, you know, in the landscape itself. Another big part of um, what I'm interested in is um, like hand handwriting, hand lettering. Um, most of my books have my handwriting in some way on it, um, or in this project, I use my dad's handwriting. So 
This is a, a window in Eden, North Carolina. This is one of the first pictures I, I took for the project. Um, there's a great um, vitamin store in Hickory called Dr. Herbs Herbs. Um, and it's a mix of you know holistic medicine and, and vitamins and um, like things you can't get at, at regular grocery stores in Catawba County. Um, but it's also He's also basically an evangelist um, who has scriptures and um, pictures of Jesus around this, this vitamin store um, and supplement store. Um, I'm not sure if it's still there anymore, but it's, it's, all, it's just one of those places where you drive by and just um, like, gee, I wonder what, what it looks like in there. Um, you know, I, I do need some, I do need some some protein powder. It's actually cheaper here than other places too. So looking at um, landscapes, real and imagined. Um, this is the back room of a of a barbecue restaurant. Um, It's also one of those places where I've been, but never, never have taken a view camera inside um, and asked to photograph. So, so working on this project allowed me to sort of act on those impulses, um, meet more, meet more folks, and, and connect um, to more places. Something else that's, I've noticed in, in my work is um, like chained up dogs, chained up, chained up dogs and, and, and children, um, not chained up children, but um, children themselves, adolescents. Um, not sure what that means. <laughs> It's a kind of um, solar system <laughs> HEPA installation inside of a window in Eden, North Carolina. That, um, that idea of, of including biblical um, stories or biblical images um, was also something that's kind of a thread through through the work too, and this this has this has that plus the hand um, the hand of the artist who who made this um, not only in location like Eden but um, in biblical stories became a part of this kind of tumultuous um, um, progression and decline of. Um, whatever I was photographing. Some creeks main appearance to Um, 
um, the educator C.H. Wiley wrote about the North Carolina Piedmont um, you know, as a um, as a former instructor to sort of get folks to to as a way to get folks to set up shop in the Piedmont to to expand the population in the area. And one of his um, he wrote about the the kind of landscape and the soil and whatnot being um, being rich and, and being sort of low hanging fruit for you to to plant and grow crops. And he said something about the the tessellation of of gold in the soil itself. Um, to think about a, a way to describe the soil um, that was rich, but this is um, these are tabletops at a um, at a furniture outlet in. Waxhaw, North Carolina. These are my the own little sort of glass tessellations of um, of the landscape. Pictures stay the same, but our times don't. <laughs> and it's, it's really hard to describe this one other than letting the image speak for it. But um, this was, I, I intended to photograph some field burning, um, you know, in the Eastern part of the state. Um, but it was kind of like photographing the moon, like you set up your camera and stuff and like, oh, I'm too far away. It just looks like a, a little dot on the on the map, so to speak. Um, so I, I did it anyway, I was out there and, and driving. Um, and this, this kid with the orange shoes, orange hair, orange gun, orange polo, um, sort of approached me and asked me to take his photograph. Um, doing his John Wayne pose. Um, this is at a, at, a, um, at a church for the art of hearing. So the, in this project, there was a mix of um, like cell phone pictures, um, 35 millimeter medium format and, and view camera photos. Um, I was sort of influenced by Walker Evans' American photographs, which are um, you know, such an array of, of styles and croppings, at least in its original form um, in that photo book. Um, so this was my kind of way of describing or riffing off that in the smallest way possible. So that the tobacco and hornworm festival um, in Durham. Is also in Eden, North Carolina, after a after a big storm. Um, this young man was advertising for the farmers market, and it's it's hard to tell in the digital representation of this, but he's got a, um, he's got a black eye. So to be more didactic, um, thinking about you know, industry um, progressing and declining. Um, it's one of the major furniture malls furniture retailers in Catawba County, um, going out of business. Being so close to, to Eden uh, while living in Durham, I returned there quite a bit just, um, just for that name, but also Whenever I went there, I seemed to um, just have a different eye and a different, um, like it was always 
a productive day um, photographing there. Um, again, more, more kind of handwriting um, on the landscape, uh, Joey's tree. And also in, in Eden. This is the oldest house in um, Caswell County. Um, after some heavy rains in 2014, um, this particular um, this particular farm was totally eroded from the creek. Um, from a flooded creek close by, and a woman was selling um, Christmas trees um, on this sort of um, new soil, new sand. So again, more, more kind of vernacular um, hand hand drawn things um, on walls that sort of describe the landscape or this kind of idealized landscape um, that became a part of um, the kind of milieu I wanted to set. Our, our, our photo heroes sort of never really leave um, my mind, especially Dan Arbus. Um, so this became a sort of, not thinking at the time, but maybe unconsciously thinking about Dan Arbus and, and her twins. Um, but I love the um, handprints on the wall or on the door next to them. The mountains, creeks, and rivers sort of became the kind of backdrop for the sort of imaginary place I was creating that came out of what's real. Um, mountain range being a backdrop to um, the man-made environment. It's in Morganton, North Carolina. I love the, the smell of crepe myrtles in August. Um, just they remind me of my great grandmother's house where, where for many decades our family went for holidays and weekend cookouts and whatnot. Um, so that smell always just permeates my memory in a way. So I felt like I needed to include um, at least some ghostly crepe myrtles. Um, I'm constantly working on simultaneous projects, um, trying in vain to find my own way, find my own place in the world, um, knowing where to stand. Um, while working on the plateau project, um, I always took several sheets of black and white film with me just to work out more ideas and pictures that I had um, as they built up from, from living away. Um, post MFA life had me thinking about refreshing my approach, but I, which had essentially been a same, the same since 2011, just taking, taking color photographs, sort of about color that exploited, exploited color um, and using, um, you know, the landscape, the Southern landscape as that backdrop. Um, so in 2016, um, I reached for more black and white film and started seeing the world not for its color, but tonality. Um, working with almost one lens and one format um, pretty strictly. 
this was sort of unassembled works um, called Forks and Branches and Creation Story. Although these bodies of work um, are branches essentially of the same fork, um, these bodies of work focus on a few different ideas. Um, Forks and Branches is, is me succumbing to those tropes and landscape or sequencing that harken back to my childhood, the creek or the river. Um, sort of looking at what I made for Plateau and um, sort of digging in a little bit more to that. There's a heavy sense of isolation to um, particularly the post MFA life and, and moving to Winston-Salem, um, you know, which also sort of rings true now. Um, at a um, parade in Catawba County from Confederate reenactors. So loneliness, in a sense, um, emptiness really permeates this work more than anything. Um, but it's really all um, part of the same tree, part of the same ecosystem. One of the best stories I've, I've gotten while, um, while out photographing came from, came from the owner of um, High Point Electric in, in High Point. Um, Buck, Buck John, he was, um, he was next in line after, after this, this man in the photograph um, fell off a roof and he described it as, um, his head getting smashed like a like an orange, um, and I thought that was a really um, <laughs> really intense way to to describe that. Um, I'm not sure how how that pertains to the work, but it's something I always think about um, when I look at this picture. This is a creek I've been going back to um, you know, forever. Um, it's just covered in covered in kudzu, and it's um, it's one we always passed over the bridge going to church. So it's, it's sort of a fix in my memory is looking a certain way. Um, 
the creation story project with which some of y'all might have saw at the Nasher um, is is again me sort of exploiting um, the Christian creation story. It's it's something I think about while sequencing photographs. It's something that permeates my seeing, um, obviously permeates my memory and how how I frame how I just frame the world. Um, so rather than photographing a certain kind of place, um, these sort of places became, um, became biblical in a way. So really exploiting um, editing, um, taking those pictures and, and go ahead and making that creation story project instead of just kind of alluding to it and, um, and other avenues. So it's, it's kind of this tension of um, science and religion with the idea of beauty and suffering uh, spinning its web among them. So again, thinking about the the Christian creation story um, you know, in in relation to you know Sunday school tales and um, big images, uh, big big kinds of imagery, big ideas, um, clouds, and obviously Christ Himself, um, but on the side of a bar in Catawba County. I think it was 2015 toward 2016 when the lightning struck a steeple um, at a church in Taylorsville, North Carolina. Um, it was a big part of part of the news in that area for several weeks, um, just because it was um, such a confluence of of happenings. Uh, you know, a random summer summer storm hits the exact steeple. Um, the cross on the steeple and the church just totally um, burned down. Um, so reaching out to um, reaching out to the pastor there, I made some photographs of the church itself um, as well as some of the things that were saved from the from the church library, which were these these books. I used to be a chaperone for um, vacation Bible school, um, sort of shepherding, shepherding students to and from different activity areas. And one of them found a snake skin. also in Eden, North Carolina. I 
I taught for a summer at the Carver Art Center. Um, I think they were third and fourth graders in darkroom photography. I, I don't <laughs> I don't recommend doing that ever again, um, just because the the chemicals are obviously um, <laughs> not very good to ingest. <laughs> Um, but this was left from a, um, a story writing class in my classroom before, before mine. Roland Barthes said, um, the portrait photograph is a closed field of forces. Four image repertoires intersect here, oppose and distort each other. In front of the lens, I am at the same time, the one I think I am, the one I want others to think I am, the one the photographer thinks I am, and the one he makes of to exhibit his art. Um, so throughout the Plateau project, at one time included a ton of, um, portraits of, of, of young men and boys of a certain age, you know, as I was photographing sort of my, sort of to push myself in a way was to ask folks to, to take their picture and tell them what I was up to, um, give them my business card um, and then see where that, that led. Sometimes folks got in touch, other times they didn't, um, but these, the series of portraits felt like felt like something else. Um, once I started to take them out of that initial sequence and in plateau, um, they became so much stronger when they were grouped uh, together. And it's just a totally different, totally different film, different gauge of the lens, different camera. The physical closeness I was getting to the subjects were also felt like it needed to be a project um, on its own. To some extent, these um, these adolescents and teens, um, you know, obviously extensions of of me in a way, but um, you know, also also their own person, also their own identity. And the title um, Stay Tender came from, um, again, something written on a, a wall by, by someone um, in spray paint just said Stay Tender. In, in a sense, that's what, that's what my aim in photography kind of is to sort of um, protect that innocence or protect that. Um, tenderness of, of seeing and experiencing the world.
also sort of hearkening back to that um, juvenile delinquency I spoke about earlier, the the kids that are, are on the periphery uh, of an event or um, or anywhere. Um, this was at, um, at the uh, Highland Games. It's like a, um, like a hometown um, version of, of traditional Celtic um, um, games, you know, feats of strength, et cetera, um, disc throwing and javelin. Um, so in a, in, a, in a sort of sea of um, sort of um, Celtic ath athletic athletes, um, these kids were there to sort of witness it. It's only one taken outside of North Carolina and in Georgia. Also, one of the one of the things I wanted to do was um, photograph the masonry building, masonry shop at my old high school, um, just from telling folks, just from telling folks about that, it um, seemed pretty different. Like not everyone maybe had that in, in their high school, and um, and actually our school is quite good and bricklaying competitions and um, tractor. Um, tractor competitions and agriculturally based um, things. It's it seemed like of a different time, but still very much ingrained um, um, in those folks in, in Catawba County. Um, and those sort of practical skills of um, you know, masonry and um, wood shop um, are sort of going away um, at this at the school, at the school district, um, which were great ways of of getting jobs for folks out of high school. Um, so I so I hung out at the shop for a day or two um, and made portraits. If there was anything like a like a like a Greek story, this was he was a kind of Sisyphus character, um, his, his sort of job at the shop was to sweep um, sweep dust out as, as folks were bringing wood in and out, kind of a kind of a never ending um, kind of never ending task, and you could you could see he was sort of picked on a little bit by the others. Um, so on a different on a different on a different note entirely, um, connecting during during lockdown has been one of the saviors of of continuing my practice. Um, connecting to brand new parents and colleagues and friends with similar aims in photography, um, it's hard um, for those of you who are our parents or have been parents. Um, it, it's hard enough knowing when to stop taking pictures and to be off duty, so to speak. But it's even harder to know when to um, when to be that parent and when to put the camera down and um, you know pick up a book to read. I think I think at this point maybe I feel like I have it, but um, but essentially we started our kind of lockdown when our daughter was born in December of 2019. Um, we were sort of used to being at home anyway for weeks on end, um, so going into going into COVID what made it that much um, harder with a newborn and infant and now a toddler. Um, so connecting with with new parents, um, especially ones that I've 
um, been connected with in the past um, has been really helpful. So um, my friend Sarah Winston and I started this photographic dialogue on, on a website called The New Nothing. Um, if you haven't been there, I recommend it. Um, it's just a huge archive of folks responding to others with their own photographs or appropriated imagery. Um, images, images that sort of ping pong um, back and forth. Um, but now as a, as a father, home and family again, just seem completely different. This is whatever, whatever I've leveled up to um, in my photographic journey. Um, this is it. So it's Sarah, um, Sarah and I responding to each other through photographs, being new parents. Her daughter was born in October, 2019. Um, and my daughter, Lily, was born in December of that year. So our, our project, um, Shades of why I think no, no one's really no one's really seen these pairings lately. So y'all are like the the test subject for these. Um, you know, outside of just our own um, our own communication. So we, the, the project started with a new nothing, but um, we've since <laughs> gone kind of offline from that to um, to sending images via text and via email. Um, this is our way to connect. This is our way to um, be together but apart, you know, um, sharing bits of parenting. Sarah as a mother living with her parents and, and me living with my wife, Meredith and, and Lily. So it's hard to know how to, how to talk about these just yet. Um, other than what I've just said, these were you know, basically made in our homes and in around our homes, trying to trying to be parents during um, during COVID, um, trapped, but also finding ways to to connect and, and keep our practice um, going. And completely switching to digital photography um, has also been a um, a learning curve for me. Um, after shooting with film mostly for ten years, um, it almost feels like learning how to see again in some ways. So throughout these, Sarah's are on the left, mine are on the right. Um, the other person I'm <laughs> I'm trying to be um, is um, my my full time job is working as a designer at Renolda House Museum of American Art. Um, it's been a great avenue to to use those skills I learned, well, obviously as a photographer, but as a designer to, um, if I'm not getting out there and uh, driving around and visiting places as I once was, trying to focus my skills on, um, on design work and being an artist within an art museum. So in, 20, in 2018, I took over that role. Um, one of the coolest things I got to work on was this um, tabloid newspaper for Dorothea Lang's America. So coming up with the sort of word mark 
Dorothy Lang's America, the script and the, and the sans serif. Um, we made a exhibition sort of takeaway piece of collateral that had our exhibition events in it that folks could pick up. Um, and we also par partnered with the Food Bank of Northwest North Carolina um, to sort of tell the story of food insecurity in the area. Um, and also a bit, a way to talk about Dorothea Lang and Walker Evans who photographed in Winston-Salem um, in 1930. Um, so it became kind of all those things and the newspaper insert was distributed and um, it actually won a, um, a gold award at the American Museum um, Alliance Conference in 2019. So another thing that I sort of, I can act on, on impulses I've been interested in is my friend Jordan um, made a project for his thesis at Corcoran where folks just took photographs off the wall. There, was, there were probably 500 photographs, um, you know, on the wall hung on pegs. And his whole idea was to just have folks take them. Um, and I love that idea. Um, I love that, um, that democratic, way of viewing art and taking it with you. Um, so I did something in that vein for the for a title wall graphic of, of this exhibition um, two springs ago. So there are different works of art on the back of each one of the pieces of paper. Um, Working with motion graphics to um, working with materials is my sort of way of, of being an artist now with, you know, when I'm not photographing um, my family. Um, you know, this sort of keeps me occupied while well, it has to, has to keep me occupied most of the day. Um, looking at materials, how they can make sense with an exhibition um, and just getting more interested in how, how design can communicate and be in concert with. Um, with works of art. This is, came from our Tiffany exhibition last year. We used a great um, bronze, um, bronze lettering, or yeah, bronze lettering and um, vinyl for the wall. And it sort of feels like being a kid again to getting to getting to draw. Um, except I get paid to do it sometimes. <laughs> So those, those transferable skills um, I learned in bookmaking. I just sort of tried to hone in on them a lot more um, through Illustrator, through just YouTube videos and just being self-taught and um, communicating with others and seeing what others are doing in the museum world when it comes to design. Um, and how can I, how can I push that um, in a meaningful way? And just how can I, how can I advance? How can I, if I'm not doing photography, if it's harder to do photography, what else can I do? Um, how else can I learn? This is for our most recent um, our exhibition coming up in February, late February. Um, I love the idea of disruption and the idea of the handmade and inevitably those, those things sort of <laughs> come out um, come out in all my work, whether it's the hand, hand drawn or hand painted signage, um, or it's whether I'm actually drawing on top of a masterpiece of American art. Um, that idea of, of delinquency, of sort of juvenile ways of, of messaging, but making it interesting um, in a way that presents, you know, really um, really complex subjects into a way that's digestible and accessible um, are things I think about in my day to day. That's, that's all I have. Thanks. So do, does, do you, does anybody have questions um, or comments or want more from uh, from Aaron? You can just speak up or 
raise your hand or throw it in the chat. Let's see. Look into the chat. No. Nope. Um, I have a question. Yeah, Lily. Um, what are your challenges with like shooting, um, like your subject, like being home? Like, do you have any like roadblocks? Like, how do you, yeah. How do you separate, and then how do you separate art from yourself at that point? Because, it, yeah. Oh man, that's a heavy question. Um, I don't, and that's what that's what I don't really. That's that's the hard thing about it is that, for me, um, it's yeah. It never stops. It's just an ongoing conversation. It's an ongoing part of your life. It's just an instance. Um, more I've you know, I have I need to spend time with my daughter I need to I need to play with her I, I need to um, I need to work on my work for work so it's it's kind of like a case by case basis I it's for for me the answer is it's not separated it's all one and the same so to do that you have to kind of always be on um, so figuring out when to stop um, is something that's still a struggle. Um, yeah, I, I just take it on a day by day basis. Um, just kind of always be open and sensitive to taking pictures, but also being open and sensitive to um, what do folks around me need and and want um, to be being available. It's it's super. Um, it causes a lot of anxiety in that way. I wish I could just say my my project is not home. My project is. Um, photographing gas stations in Los Angeles, but it's, it's not, it's, um, I can't separate art and life and I don't think I should. Um, let me, so in the, in the chat, Jacob Moss, uh, I may have missed you covering this in the first part because I was at the mercy of uh, California DMV. Um, can you speak to your technical practice a little bit, how that varies from camera to camera and just what you find yourself honing in on when making images or conceiving of images? Mm -hmm. I feel like I, I think in one, in one style after just looking at, um, just looking at my own work, it, it feels like I kind of always see, see in wide angle, see in, um, you know, see in the, that's kind of like my default setting is to, is to look at the bigger picture. Um, there's a great Lee Freelander quote where he talks about photography is not just about um, your, your uncle Nate with the dog, but it's about uncle Nate and the dog and someone watering the flowers in the background and this edge of a car in the frame and all the little things that are, um, that are the characteristics of life. And so I sort of think of it that way and then after I sort of review the pictures later, I'm like, you know what, the, the interest, the interest in this image is what's actually really close up. Like that's the thing I'm interested in, not, not the things all around it, which may, may or not be superfluous, but um, yeah, from camera to camera, it's hard, especially, um, especially ones that vary so much, ones that's handheld and one you actually have to you know, set up and preconceive. Mostly it's been, um, you know, kind of on the fly right now, um, photographing with, with the family. Um, it's, you know, it, like I, I think I photograph it and then think about it later. Aaron, you, you said um, at the beginning, you know, that you were uh, pondering putting together high chairs and, uh, and how to install car seats. And then later that nice Robert Adams quote of things done and left undone. And I, I mean, this is a little bit similar to Lily's question, but I'm curious how photographing one's own life, um, the, how you deal with the done and left undone. I mean, you know, is there a, is, is there more, 
uh, desire to sort of protect and 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 avoid the kind of um, edge of irony than there is out in the world when um, you know when when it's all just sitting there before you, but it's not yours. Mm -hmm. That's that's something I think about all the time. Um, I I basically just want to make sure that everyone's everyone's safe and good and fed and rested and then i can pull out the camera um so i i, I still sort of think about photography and think about you know juxtaposition and, and irony and all that um but now it's definitely a little more a little more guarded it's, it's coming from a um a more protective protective place for me um I need to. I need to make sure I'm a dad first, and then a photographer second. I mean, that's just how it is. That's just my priorities. Like if, like if I know Lily and Meredith are are good, and we're just playing, and I feel comfortable taking out my camera, um, or like if just being open and sensitive to the fact that you know they've they've had rough days and they actually need help. Um, not that they never not need help, but just to be available for them first um, and be a photographer second. I, 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 I don't like to like number things like that, but it's, that's really what it is. Um, if I'm, if I'm open to them first, then I feel like I can sort of be open to making pictures second. There's a question in the chat. Um, are you always taking photos with the intent of making a project? If not, how does your approach change when you're making photographs just for the sake of shooting? Hmm. No, I, th I think um, I think I'm always taking pictures just for the sake of shooting, um, but really, it's more for the sake of sanity. <laughs> it's for the sake of like being being me in a way, because um, it's been such a part of my life and my practice I just I have to do these things in order to to to, to be open and available as a as a person um, so yeah it's it's like it's like keeping the tap water on you know it just sort of comes comes from you like um, Lily's question um, about how do you separate it you don't it comes from the same tap so it's extremely hard to be on duty all that time as a seer and a maker of pictures. But now I'm not always thinking about a specific, specific project. I'm thinking about what I like and I'm thinking about what I want to say, um, thinking about specific scenes. And the projects really come out in the editing part of it. Um, like I said, I wish I could conceive of a project and um, just say, I want to photograph um, you know, gas stations in Los Angeles. It's um, it's not that it's it's it, it's it's my life and it's um, that much harder to to make work from it. Um, yeah, it's, it's for the basically the I need I need to do this thing. I guess I'll ask one last question, or, or it doesn't have to be the last question. But um, you know, your your photographs of um, oh, like that color photograph of the trailer, uh, you know, in, uh, at a certain distance with those amazing lights. Um, those kinds of of photographs that are both of home, in the large metaphoric sense, but but not of your uh, familial place. Do you, um, can you find a way to, to, to do both and, you know, to be, to be photographing the, the, your, your daughter's bath or ketchup all over her face or whatever that was. Um, and then, you know, but also that other stuff, which is clearly uh, related in part of what you, what you do, who you are. That's something I've not, um... I've not figured out how to combine yet. It's 
um, probably due to COVID and being staying at home. It's like staying at home. And mm -hmm. I think there, but those are running lists of those sort of pictures in my head. Um, I think they can be combined and sort of what Sarah and I were getting at in that Shades of Wyeth right. series. Um, her landscape and her home in New York and sort of my landscape and home in North Carolina. And I haven't, I haven't thought about those pictures yet because I haven't made them. Um, they're just kind of in my head for now. Um, I, do, I do think they're part of the same, same place. I think, you know, just like in the other series where there's portraits and, and landscapes, um, it's all part of, part of your being. Um, and it just makes it that much more broad in its scope and maybe a little bit more relatable to, um, but I haven't, I haven't yet pieced those two together. It's, um, I feel like the more, the more interesting ones are her now because my daughter now, because it's, I think our pediatrician said it's, this is the last day they're going to be this young. <laughs> and I just, I just kept thinking about that. And that's a little bit, a little bit sad, but um, trying to capture that moment has been priority now. Just take one photograph every day. Yeah. At least. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, Aaron. Um, let me see. Let me. I just saw another. Let me make sure this isn't a. Uh, no, this is the the uh, the notice for the upcoming. But thanks, Aaron, for um, for this tour and for for what is uh, so obviously it's it's. It is COVID informed, but it's also related even before COVID. Your your work is sort of, um, well, I, I guess a strategy for COVID, um, you know, COVID or not. <laughs> and uh, and I think that's, you know, I'm I'm so struck generally by the the our um, the emptiness of of the here and now. Um, and yet, you know, emptiness is such a powerful um, part of photography and, and of the frame and of, um, you know, of reality generally. And, uh, and so, you know, we sort of got emptiness to the 10th power, I guess, potentially um, in, in the middle of COVID, which I think is probably not great right now because we're dealing with the, the not great aspects of COVID, but I think ultimately there's a body of work that's going to really resonate in, you know, in, in ways that, um, that we'll have to give COVID a little credit, but anyway, it's, it's easy to see that in your work. And I really appreciate it and appreciate you taking, um, bringing, bringing the message. Yeah. I've, I've really enjoyed it. It's, this is the first time I've talked about photography probably since, um, well, in a long time. So it's, um, it feels really good to get sort of back to my roots and back to thinking about um, photography and this stay at home here, which is home's always been a part of it. But like you said, it's to the nth degree um, yeah. now how we how we navigate and what bodies of work come out of that. Um, just been really energizing to, to talk with you all and to talk with you and Ted. And, and uh, thanks for asking. Sure. Well, thanks and stay with it all. And, and uh... We'll stay in touch. Keep using that word stay. Exactly. Uh, take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks Aaron.